All right. I think we are back. Whew. That was quite an ordeal. Uh, had a bunch of power lines go down around the area, given uh, the amount of trees that are around here. So, but we are back. And I'm looking at my computer and it looks like it's up and running. Audio looks like it's working. So, how's everybody doing? I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> That thing went out and I said to Megan, you've got to be kidding me. You guys were so nice to, to wait. Um, the power looked like it might come back on for a minute and you know how it does it. It, it tries to come back on and then the transformer says, mm, nope. But uh, here we are. So um, we got about 20 minutes into it last time, got through some of the slides, but you know, I, so I was thinking, well, maybe what we should do is just press on from there and somehow edit the two videos together. But I, because we had a couple of people come in later and, um, you know, maybe the best thing to do is just start over. It won't take that long. Um, I know I'm long winded, but I won't do my introduction again. Uh, we can just, we can just start the, the thing. So if that sounds good, uh, I will go ahead and get rolling. We have six watching now, which is fantastic. Hopefully the rest will be able to come in, um, but let's get rolling. So I've become an expert now at screen sharing. Share that screen and to infinity and beyond. What do I do now? Okay, slideshow, play from start. All right. So, we are, uh, just as a brief, brief, brief introduction, we are going through the basics of Sumerian grammar. So, you know, Sumerian's a very fun language, I think, to read. Really cool stuff. Of course, when you read Mesopotamian literature and you know how to read it in the original, it's like being able to read the Hebrew Bible in the original or the Greek New Testament. And, uh, you know, if you can if you can learn some of the basics, you can read royal inscriptions, you can read some of the economic texts. Um, if you keep at it for a while, um, and you know, if you can get up with somebody to, to study that knows Sumerian really well one-on-one, -on -one, and you can start to advance into literary texts, it becomes a lot of fun. But the really nice thing about learning Sumerian um, this way is that while you might not be able to you know, break, break uh, Gilgamesh and Huawa A down, um, and do a commentary on it, you'll be able to look at um, people's arguments like Zachariah Sitchin when he says things like Dingir is made up of two signs, Din and Gear, uh, and say, whoa, buddy, uh, nope, Dingir is one sign, and the reason there's an NG sound in there is because there's a nasalized G. That's not because there are two, uh, two syllable or two uh, different signs there. So, Anyway, I hope that uh, I hope that everybody's watching uh, really enjoy this, and I'm I'm just excited to be able to do this. So, as I said before, any questions that you have, uh, anything that um, you want to ask me, throw it on in the side chat. Megan's watching, my gorgeous wife, and uh, and um, she'll she'll come and alert me if I miss something. But I'm I'm eyeing it as we go through this. So let's get a rolling. We're going to look at nouns, adjectives, verbs, and verbal chains, the genitive construction, which is basically the way you uh, put two words together using the word of. So the house of John, that's a genitive construction. And then nominal case endings and their infixes, which is basically a fancy way of saying how do they use prepositions. So we will take a look at it. So how do cuneiform signs work? Well. Uh, as we talked about before I got cut off, a single sign can represent a number of things. First, it can represent a word. So um, the on sign, which it can also be read dingir, is uh, the, the it can be, if it's on, it means heaven or sky. If it's dingir, it means God. But that's it right there. It looks like a star. That's the on sign. Uh, A2, you can kind of tell it looks like a floor plan of a house. That's the sign. The A2 is sign for house and i will uh, somebody asked about this and i was getting ready to explain it when i got cut off 
I'll go ahead and explain it now. That little subscript number uh, two is um, it, it when they started to um, you know translate through and to understand how Sumerian worked, they realized that there were a number of signs that would be read a or that's how we say the letter e in these signs um or um there's an um and then there's an um three and then there's um or there is a nya two and there's a um well that's not a good sign to use there's uh there's may there's may three so m e and then m e three what that means is they came across an a may sign and then they came across a second may sign and they said well I guess we'll call this one May 2 or, and then they came across another one. They said, well, we'll call this one May 3. Uh, and so that's what you have. So you, you, they don't, they don't always go in order like that. Um, and just because A shows up and then there's A2, that doesn't mean that A is more prevalent. It just means that that was the first one they saw. Anyway, but that's what those mean. So there are, uh, if you have, a2, that means you can probably find um, the letter E being read, uh, another syllable that has the same phonetic value, A, but it's a different sign. It has a different meaning. So there's A. Ah, let me show you. So Gal, Mu, there's Mu2, there's Mu10. Um, and that just means there are different um, signs that, um, different signs that have the phonetic value Mu. But they just name them so that so that when you transliterate something, when you when you take it from, hang on, let me get my laser pointer up here. When you take it from this sign form and you write it in English characters, that's called a transliteration. So when they transliterated it, instead of just writing A, they want to tell you. I'm, when I say A, I'm talking about this sign, so I'm going to call it A2. So um, if there were the Mu sign here, which isn't represented on the screen, and then you came across the Mu2 sign, which is a completely different sign, they would write Mu2 so that you know it's not the Mu sign, it's the Mu2 sign. Okay, so what, you, you'll see that as we go through this. But I hope that uh, hope that explains it a little bit. So ah means water, but ah too, which is another sign that is read ah as well. Ah too means arm or strength or power. So they write ah too in transliteration so that you know it's not talking about the water sign, it's talking about the arm sign. Lugal means king, nin means lady. All of these words uh, are, are signs, that they represent signs that are just single words. That's So that's how a sign can be used to represent a word, but it can also be used to represent a syllable. So in the verbal form, ga'an do, ga'an do 11, they they needed to write on in here because that's part of the sound, gandu. So in, this doesn't mean sky. This it doesn't mean anything except it's part of this. Uh, it's a syllable that's being used to write the on sound. Um, so ga on do 11. So you can't read sky in here because it doesn't mean sky. It uh, It's just a syllable. The same thing here with mu. Mu doesn't mean name here or year. It, it's just a syllable. It's used to write the mu sound in the verbal form mundu, mu un do three. And the same thing here, sheish means brother. Ani as a morpheme, as, a, as an ending, a lexical ending means his. Ani means his or her. So sheish ani means his or her brother, right? So it doesn't mean brother, water, ni. It, it, the a ah there is part of a, uh, a grammatical form. So, so a single sign can represent a word. It can represent a syllable. And it can also represent these cool things called determinatives. So these are um, these are signs that go before or after nouns, and they tell the reader, "Hey, um, this thing that's coming after this sign is part of a particular 
class. So that sounded really confusing. Let me make it easier. The Dengir sign here, uh, which is that star sign that you saw earlier, uh, if you put it before a name, it tells you that the name that comes after it is a god or a goddess. So Dengir Inanna is how you would say this, Dengir Inanna, and that means that whatever comes after the Dengir sign is a god or a goddess. Ki means land or earth, and if it comes after a name, it tells you that that name is uh, like a city or a geographical region or something. So Eridu Ki means the city of Eridu. It's telling you that it's part of the land or geographical region class. Mushen means bird. Um, so if it comes after a, a, a noun, that means that that noun is probably a bird or something like it. So Anzu is the great Anzu bird. So if you have Anzu Mushen, it's the Anzu bird. All they're doing is telling you that it's in the class of birds. Nish, and that um, na that's the nasalized G that's in the word dingir. Um, nish, it's pronounced N-G, essentially. So nish means wood. Um, interestingly enough, it also means penis, which I think is comical. Anyhow, um, don't know why I brought that up. So uh, nish guza, the, the word that comes after nish, is made of wood so guza means like a chair or a throne um <laughs> making wrote penis and it's <laughs> it's uh it's being held for review which i think is hilarious um uh, that's funny so uh anyhow so nish guza guza is a chair or a throne this is telling you that this noun is made of wood so there's um a sign that means um, that means stone, na four. So if na four is there, uh, you know that would indicate that it is um, uh, that it's made of stone and and so on. Anyhow, so a single sign can represent a word, it can represent a syllable, and it can also represent a determinative. And don't be disheartened. Context usually makes it very clear which one is going on. So, yes, Zanos Carthage, I know <laughs> what, what we're talking about. Everybody does. It, yeah. <clears throat> okay, sorry. So, moving right along. Uh, nouns. Uh, euphemisms in the ancient world. You got that right. So, um, nouns are not classified as masculine or feminine. They are distinguished animate or inanimate. So... Like I talked about before, sheish ani, ani means his or her. It could be either one. Um, so they don't distinguish between masculine and feminine. They distinguish between animate and inanimate. Now, there are different types of nouns. There are single sign nouns, like we've seen uh, thus far. Uh, A2 means house. Lugal means king. But then there are compound nouns where you have uh, two signs put together to make a single noun. So dub sar means scribe, dub means tablet, and uh, sar means to write. It's the verb to write. So a uh, tablet writer, that's a scribe. Um, a2 means house, gal means big. So the big house is the palace. So those two signs go together to make a single noun. Um, plurals, uh, again, as we mentioned just before we got cut off, uh, nouns can either be singular or plural by themselves. So Lugal can mean king or kings. It just depends on the context. And uh, I mentioned that, uh, again, don't, don't get disheartened, even though I have this uh, frowny face up here, don't get disheartened. Um, context is king and it, it really does indicate in so many cases um, whether you should read something as singular or plural. However, there is a way that they can mark, there are a couple of ways, but I want to point out the, the main one, that they can tell you that a word definitely is plural, and that is by writing ene after the noun. So you see here, dingir, here's how dingir looks, by the way. It's not a combination of din and gear. It's ding, 
ng sound, ear, ding ear. So you can do away with Sitchin's argument uh, almost immediately um, about din and gear being the, how does he say that, the righteous flashers or something? Anyway, all kinds of problems with that argument, nonetheless. Um, so isn't it great that you know some Sumerian already? You can you can fight the good fight. Anyhow, this, what did we say, Megan? The, the sane world depends on you. Hey, Shane, how are you? Uh... Let's see what else is going on in the side chat here. Just thought it'd be easier to get this. Ah, uh, yeah. Wild Heart 666. You know that's right. <laughs> um, okay, sorry. So uh, we will talk about this R right here in a little bit. This is called an Auslaut. And um, again, we'll, we'll talk about it in just a second. But what they're trying to represent here is putting the ending N on the word Dingir. And so they're saying Dingir N, which means gods. They can also show plurality based on the reduplication of the noun or the adjective. And reduplication, of course, is just a fancy way of saying writing it twice. So if they said Lugal, that could mean king or kings. But Lugal, Lugal, they're either saying kings or all the kings. So uh, also if they reduplicate the adjective, we're going to talk about this soon. Gal means big. The adjective goes after the noun. If they write Lugal Gal, that just means big king or great king. But if they write Lugal Gal Gal, that means great kings, plural. And you'll notice that in verbal forms and nouns plural, and adjectives, plurality of form often means plurality of subject or object. So, but don't worry about that. We'll get into it later. Uh, by the way, as we go through these things, and I've said this on the, the recorded videos, it, you'll find yourself as you go through these courses, as, as as you go through these lessons, sorry, you'll find yourself in the fog. And this isn't something that I came up with. It was something that my Greek, um, the, the Greek grammar that I used to learn New Testament Koine Greek, um, <laughs> that they said you, you'll find yourself in the fog or in the haze. And in the current lesson that you're going through, you'll find that you sort of knows you'll sort of knows you'll sort of know what's going on but not really but you'll look back two lessons before and you'll know exactly what that lesson's all about and what it's saying um and the same thing will happen when you get two lessons ahead you'll look you'll be in the haze or the fog there but you'll look back to the lesson uh two lessons ago this is very confusing sorry but the the lesson that you were hazy on um, will be, uh, you'll be very clear about what it said. Anyhow, okay, that was, that was confusing. I apologize profusely. All right. Adjectives. So they come after the noun. Um, so Lugal Gal is great king. They usually appear with an ah suffix. So, uh, you'll see a nita, nita tu, um, kalaga, so like mighty man, man, nitatu is a man. So, uh, kala means mighty or strong, whatever. Um, this ah afterwards, and again, we're going to talk about this chi in just a second, but, um, and right, right here, uh, that a goes on the end of the adjective great, or I mean, uh, strong or mighty to tell you that it's an adjective. Now, it doesn't always appear, like up here, you don't always get the A, but often adjectives will have this A attached to it to tell you that it's an adjective. Unfortunately, as uh, some of my uh, students that have been uh, in the Hangouts with me know coming up, or if you've watched the videos, A also indicates other things, but again, context tells you what they are. Now, we need to have a brief excursus to talk about what are Auslauts? Good German word. Auslauts are what we saw on the word Dingir, Rene. That R here is being reduplicated. It's being copied to from the Dingir, the R here, to attach this vowel sound to it. So instead of saying Dingir, Ene, which would have a glottal stop in it, it would make you say Dingir, Ene, like in 
the word uh uh-oh, uh-oh, in between uh and oh, you have to close off your throat to say uh uh-oh. To say dingier, ene, you'd have to have that glottal stop in there. So instead of that, they put the R so that it's dingierene, dingierene. So uh, kala, you might wonder what this G is. Kala, when you put a, a vowel after it, there's a G that is actually at the end of the word that doesn't show up unless you put an, a, a vowel after it. So it's actually kalag if you have a vowel coming after it. So kalaga. It would actually be kalaga, kalaga. The same thing here, gal la. Instead of writing gal a, they will often write gal la because they're just bringing that L over to attach a vowel. That's all that is. So there are a lot of words that have L slouts that don't show up until you put, they have a they have a consonant at the end of the word that doesn't show up. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Akios Era says, uh, needing to know German in order to translate Sumerian into English. It's so true. Learning is indeed hard, but we make it easy here. It helps that you guys are brilliant. So, but that's what's going on here. If you have a vowel coming after it, you'll often see these other consonants um, showing up. So, I'll just pause for a second. Does that make sense? Did, any questions about that? Or as my uh, Semitics professor used to say, what questions do you have? <laughs> I love it when my wife quotes The Office. It's amazing. All right, well, if you have questions, please stop me. I know there's a lag here, so I don't want to give you a bunch of dead air. Okay, some adjectives, as I said, don't always need the A. So you will often see gal or tor. Gal means big, tor means small. Mach means, and that's what this uh, H, they call this H rocker. Um, mach, it's a nice German lach sound. Um, so mach means magnificent. So if you had lugal mach, it's the magnificent king. Lugal tor would be the small king. Anyway. So you notice though that these don't have the A appended to them. So adjectives don't always require that A, but they often have it, so now you know what it is. Okay, so moving into verbs and verbal chains, and I know that I'm probably going through this somewhat quickly. I think I, I'm pretty sure I take more time in the actual videos, but again, any time that you have questions about this stuff and you want me to go through it in a bit more detail, just email me, and uh, you know we'll we'll either set up a hangout or we'll um, you know maybe we'll just do it over email, whatever works. And if we have two or three people that you know want to do a hangout at the same time, we can do that. We can do it live. We can do it off air. Whatever everybody's comfortable with. So anyhow, okay. So verbs and verbal chains. So anytime that I've ever taken an ancient language course, we've always had to start with some English grammar, and. Uh, this is no exception. So there is a difference between transitive verbs and intransitive verbs. Intransitive verbs are those that the subject does not act upon anything. It doesn't do anything to something else. So Jimmy runs. Jimmy in that sentence isn't running the lawnmower or the race. He's just running. So Jimmy runs. That's an intransitive sentence. It's an intransitive verb. It uh, doesn't require an object. However, Bob hit. You always ask the question, what? What did Bob hit? Bob hit the ball. So because there is an object here, a direct object, this is a transitive verb. Bob is doing. The subject is doing something to the object. So this is intransitive versus transitive. In Sumerian, you have the same thing. A3 means to go out. So notice here, A2, A3. This is a completely different word, a completely different, um, this is a verb that means to go out. It doesn't have any relation to A2, which is house. It's just a, a, a homophonous sign. It sounds the same. Okay, so A3 means to go out. This is intransitive. Now, um, 
do three on the other hand means to build so you have to build something right so he builds the house or he builds the temple or you know he builds the statue whatever it is that he does he's building something so that the subject is acting upon something it's it's doing something to an object so that's a transitive verb that's uh, going to be important as we go through verbs um zanos carthage do i want to go out with you well you can ask megan <laughs> <laughs> all right um oh wait because of the shoo. You know, I'd like to blame the MS for me taking so long to get that one, but I'm just slow. <sighs> wow. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, hang on a second. Charles Denny, this is kind of off topic, but I'm just wondering, did Sumerian have case markers? That is a fantastic question. Um, and uh, yes and no. Um, Yep. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. Um, so yes, sort of. Um, we're going to talk about case markers actually in this review. Um, but I, I can talk about this now for just a second. So Sumerian, this is a little confusing. Sumerian is an agglutinative language. And what that means is it it doesn't mark um it doesn't it, it doesn't mark intransitive subjects or objects it doesn't mark objects what it does mark is the subject of a transitive verb and it marks it with the letter e okay what does that mean um well here i think actually this is yes uh no it doesn't because i don't have the subject explicitly marked here anyway um so what what they do and you know what actually we are going to talk about this because we talk about the ergative that's what that's called the ergative marker you know what uh charles let's let's hold off for just a second it's a fantastic question let's hold off on that until we get to um the ergative but i, I promise i'll talk about it if i somehow don't please remind me okay so in english just to show you sort of how the sumerian sentence goes together in English, we would say he built a house for the king. Well, we've we've seen here that lugal means king, a two means house, do three means to build. Don't worry about these two things. This is part of the verbal chain. Just trust me when it means he built the object house. This means uh, yeah. Don't worry about that just yet. Ra means two or four. It's like the preposition to or the preposition for. It can mean either one. And they just attach it to the noun. So he built the house or a house for the king. That's how the sentence goes together. Does that make sense? I don't know why I asked that because unless you guys type out yes in 10 seconds, I won't know. Anyway, don't worry about it memorizing that or anything. I just want you to get a feel for how this thing works. Okay, other examples of verbs. Um, a, a ru is a compound verb. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But a munaru, he dedicated, right? Um, oh, cool. Sanos Carthage gets it kinda. Hey, that's all I could ask for because this is not this this is not easy. But uh, if you guys even sort of get this, you're doing really well. Seriously, um, aru is a verb. It means to dedicate. So he dedicated four x. Hey, sweetheart. Sorry, my uh, my eleven year old just walked in. She's saying good night. You want to say you want to say hi to everybody? Hello. All right. This is a future Sumerologist. Just kidding. No. She's going to be a lawyer. <laughs> All right. I love Have you, sweetheart. Night. Have a good night. All right. Um, NMG4 is another verb. I, I don't know why, but I gave you compound verbs here, verbs that have two parts to them. Sorry about that. But NMG4 means um, to reply. It's to return a word. 
So NMG4, so he replied to him. Same thing here. Pa A3 means to make manifest. So he made manifest. You would think that these are weird words uh, or we weird verbs for me to be giving you. And they are, except that they show up a lot. So to make manifest is it shows up. So anyhow, these are verbal forms. This is how they look. So uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Akia Sarah says that doesn't make sense. Yep. It, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, I'm going to explain it in just a minute. Um, Zana says, I'd like to see the characters for each or it written in Sumerian because it looks a little funny with the numbers at the bottom of it. Yeah. Um, if, if we were doing an alphabetic language, I would say right on. That's exactly what we should do. So if I ever teach you guys Hebrew, which I'm very happy to do or Greek, we will not put it in transliteration like this. We won't put it in these English characters. Unfortunately, Sumerian and Akkadian are not, um, they're not uh, alphabetic scripts. So each character doesn't just mean one letter. Um, they can mean, I mean, the, 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 um, the bod sign, for example, can be read be, bod, bot, bot, or till, right? It just depends on the sentence. And sometimes it's not entirely clear. So I have to sort of put them in English transliteration uh, so that you can know exactly what we're talking about. I promise you'll get used to it. And um, But we will, at the end of each lesson, there are cuneiform signs that you're learning. So it'll it'll become clearer. That's a good point. And I, I, I wish that we could just do that right off the bat. Okay, so I've sh I sort of put the cart before the horse here. I apologize for that. There are simple verbs like do three, just one sign. It means to build. A3 to go out, G4 to return, or DIM2 to form or to fashion. However, there are compound verbs where there are two parts. Um, there's a part that comes before the verbal chain, which is that, that thing that you've seen, mu, un, do, three. Um, and... Um, uh, sorry, I lost what I was saying. Um, right. Uh, so compound verbs have two parts. They have a verbal part, like G4 means to return. And they have a noun that comes before it that's part of the verb. Nm means word, like a, like a spoken word or something. So to return a word means to reply. Shu means hand, and like this is this is to extend. So like to receive. Shu t. Shu is the noun. T is the verb. It means to receive. Um, gu three de tu. Gu three is voice. So the noun de tu means to pour out. So to pour out the voice. This is a verb. It goes together. It means to say. Um, and see saw two together means to set straight. Sorry, I don't want to inundate you with things, but these are compound verbs, right? They have a noun part and a verb part. Sometimes it works out that they, they make logical sense together. Sometimes they don't. So, okay. So there are, uh, we've, we, what we've seen thus far are verbs that show up in what we've been calling verbal chains. So mu, na, do, three, or mu, un, do, 11. Those are all parts of verbal chains, but um, you don't have to have that verbal chain. You can have the, the verb just by itself with an A, and sometimes it doesn't even need the A, but um, a verb with an A on it is called a participle, and we have these in English. Um, so running, swimming, jumping, any of the ing verbs, uh, they're participles. Uh, you can have a gerund, you can have, anyway, but yeah. Um, in Sumerian, that's what we call them. It's not a, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. So nyen means to go, like to walk. Nyen na, which is nyen a, so they're just using that n, you see that there, 
just repeating the end here. Nian A means going, right? So the going man. However, there's another way that you can read these, and uh, it can be reading it as a passive. So Shum Tu means to give. So if you had Shum Tu Ma, and you read that passively, it means given. So something that's given. So the point is, and you don't, this is, you don't, I just want you to be introduced to it. You don't have to memorize this or anything. But participles, if you have a verbal form with an ah on it, this is something that you do need to be able to do as you read. Um, and so it's it's going to require going back through and thinking about this stuff and making flashcards and that sort of thing, if you're serious about it. But um, you're going to often see something like ah on the end of a word. And you have to ask yourself, okay, how is this ah functioning? If it's on the end of a word like gal, which is an adjective, which means big, and you see gal la, you say, oh, this ah must be telling me that gal is an adjective, right? This is an adjective. However, if you if you saw um, lu gal nyen na, that's another a on the end of a word, you, you'd ask yourself, all right, is this an adjective? Well, no, nyen's not an adjective. Nyen is a verb. It means to go. Aha, the a ah here must be a participle because that goes on a verb. So this must be, if lugal nyen na, it must be the going king, right? So that's that's what you have to be able to do. You have to sort of work through your options, I guess, is the best way to, to think about it. Again, you're in no way expected to remember all this stuff right now. That's why I've made these into videos. I'm actually um, putting together a, a um, uh, introductory Sumerian grammar, something that's really easy like this, that just gives you all the basics. Um, it is. It's like a game of Clue. Um, it's Professor Plum in the study with the pipe. And he was really nice with the pipe. It's because we're not violent people. So if we had N, which means Lord, Atu, which we mentioned earlier, means arm or strength, which those things make sense together, right? Shumtu means to give. So if there's an A on the end, you say, ah, this is probably a participle because this, this is indicating a participle because shumtu is a verb. So shumtu ma means given. So the Lord, strength, given, and we haven't looked at this yet, but um, does anybody remember what the ding ear sign means if it's superscripted like this before a name? That's right. I know you all got it as I said it. It means that this is a deity. This is a god, Nunamnir. So this means the Lord, given strength, who is given strength by Nunamnir or of Nunamnir. Okay. Oh, Kirk Cameron says, yeah, uh, Quizlet is a cool site to make flashcards. It is. There's also a... Um, there's also a flashcards program that I recommend. It's a it's a, it costs like four bucks or something, but it's called Flashcards Deluxe. I actually put a little video together. I am not technologically savvy, anybody that knows me, but I put a little video together and posted it on uh, Digital Hammurabi, um, uh, so that uh, people know how to upload flashcards to it. Anyway, Flashcards Deluxe. I used it for my PhD. It's it's the best flashcards program that I've found thus far, but that doesn't mean it is the best. It's just the best that I've found. By the way, um, uh, and I, Trevor, I'm going to get your question here in just a second. Um, if you're watching and you like what we're doing here, do me a favor and click the like button. And if you're here and you haven't subscribed, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody here has, but if you haven't, uh, please subscribe. We're trying to get to 900 today. We're so close. You guys are amazing for getting us even this close. But uh, yeah. Um, okay, Trevor, um, got here late, still watching at minus 20 minutes. So at 1.5 to catch up, it's alive. What is the Sumerian equivalent of it's all Greek to me? <laughs> I've read that as a serious question, that, but uh, you know what? Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Um, I'd have to think about that. Um, it would make the assumption that there's a Sumerian word for Greek. Uh, anyway, that's a good question. In, in its own way. 
All right. So, um, right. That's participle. So again, the big thing here is not to memorize the different meanings of participles or something. If you walk away from this right now and you say to yourself, all right, if I see A on the end of something, I have to ask myself, is it an adjective or is it a participle? You are way ahead of the game. You're doing an amazing job. So um, that's all I could ask for. Uh, something like, why do you curse me? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. The genitive. Bum, bum, bum. We're doing really well, by the way. Um, and again, keep those questions coming if, uh, if you got them. So the genitive, it's the word of, right? So if I want to say the house of Josh, I would say that's, that's a genitive construction. And the way they do that is they put ok at the end, they put two nouns in a row, and on the end of the second noun, they put the they put the the morpheme, the 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 form ak. Okay. Unfortunately, it often appears without the k. Why is that? Well, remember we were talking about earlier that um, um, we were still talking about. Uh, sorry, we were, still, we were talking about how some words like kala end in a G, but the G doesn't show up unless there's a vowel that comes after it, right? Well, the same thing is true of this morpheme, ak. So unless there's another vowel that comes after it, uh, you're not going to see that K. So, for example, A2 means house, lugal means, you got it, king, um, la, this a. Ah, I know, I know, I know. It's another A. Ah, but um, this is another one that, that makes sense. I'll explain why. Um, this A ah represents ak, right? So if we normalized it, that's what we call this, where we use these little periods. A2, lugal, ak. This means the house of the king. The house of the king. Notice this little swoop that I'm doing, right? The house of the king. This is some one of the things that you're going to do as you translate. You always go to the outside. You always go to the outside and then come back in. You'll see what I mean here shortly. Um, but notice that the K doesn't show up, and that's because the swoop. And that's because the uh, there's no vowel after this, right? So um, you're only going to see A2 Luga La. Now, how do I know that this isn't a this isn't marking an adjective? How do I know that this isn't marking um, a participle? Because that's A can do those two things, right? Uh, th those two things, correct? Well, here we know that Lugal is a noun. It means king. It's not an adjective like you know Gal or uh, Tor or Mach. So we know it's not marking an adjective, and it's not a verb. Lugal is a noun. It's not a verb. So what could this ah be? Oh, well, could it be the genitive? Well, yep, here we go. And this makes sense. The genitive makes sense here. House of the king. So that's how we translate it, the house of the king. So that's how Sumerian works. Now, there are some rules. We've talked about one already. If the word ends in a consonant, you will only see the ah. So A2, Lugal ends in um, a consonant. So you're only going to see the A, A2 Lugal La, which represents A2 Lugal Ak. So if it ends in a consonant, you're only going to see the A. Ah. Oh, so there you go, the house of the king. I didn't need to put that English there, did I? Because you guys translated it like immediately. Now, if there's another grammatical marker following the genitive, the K will appear. For example, we know that N means what? You got it, the plural, right? So if we have N that comes after the genitive, you're going to see that ak. See it there? Ak. So the K is going to show up. So dumu means child. And we're doing the swoop here. So we swoop all the way to the end. That's how you do this. You start at the beginning. You go to the outside. You know what this is like? This is like, um, 
well i think that's what it's like the the math thing i'm terrible at math the is it please my dear aunt sally i don't know the thing with the the parentheses yep you know what i've probably massacred that anyway i apologize for all you mathematicians out there or to you to all you mathematicians um anyway you go from the beginning child or children to the outside and you have this n um which means um plural so that means that dumu is the plural right it's marking dumu as plural so the sons then you come in of the king the sons of the king or the children of the king and this is how you would normalize it right the children of the king and there we go i did it order of operations you got it all right so rules number two or three i don't remember if the word ends in a vowel you probably won't see anything so ningirsu or ninyirsu we always just say ningirsu because it's easier it's, sorry about that um, ningirsu is a god actually this is ningirsu ak right there's there's you can see uh, there's a genitive that can come after it um but because this ends in a u um um you don't see the a or the k so that stinks but again context will tell you so this is the lady of or the lord of girsu the city of girsu okay the a of the genitive will replace the vowel of many common endings so um again this is just something to be aware of don't worry about memorizing this but we talked about let me go to the next one we talked how ani ani means his um so ni means his b means its so inanimate animate right well if you have b on the end of something and you have ak after it so let's do it let's do it the other way um if we had the house of his brother Boy, that's probably not easy to picture is it anyway knee if there's a if there's a genitive that comes after knee instead of them writing knee ak or knee ah or not writing the genitive at all what they do is that a um, like does battle with the i and wins so instead of it being knee or knee ah it's nah that's how they do it anyway just be aware of that because you're going to see it and You'll go, what is this? And I'll say, you remember that knee ah thing? And you say, ah, I do remember because you're such an amazing teacher. Mm. Okay. Anyway, so uh, we're, we're, we're almost done with genitives, I promise. There are three ways that a genitive could be formed. There is the normal way that we've seen a million times now. A2, Luga La, so the house of the king. There is what's called the anticipatory genitive, which um, is not, oh, thanks, Honest Carthage. Um, I, uh, you don't see this one a ton, but you see it enough that I feel like I should tell you about it. Um, they literally say, and you can figure it out if you see it, of the king, his house of the king his house and what that means is house of the king the reason that they do this is it's emphasizing oh and I, you know what I, I put this oops uh, i put this backwards sorry um this should be uh lugal ak a2 on the my bad sorry can you ignore this everybody i put my hand up to the screen to cover it so I didn't really do anything. If you can ignore this, that'd be awesome. Let's just do it here. Of the king, his house. So what this does is it emphasizes the king. 
because it puts it up front. Normally you would see A2 Luga La, but here it's emphasizing the king. So it's like saying the king's house as opposed to saying the king's house. Anyway. Then there's this other one that is shows up even less frequently, but let's just talk about it really quick. Um actually, you know what? I'm I'm not even gonna bother with this. Um because I talk about it in the video, but it 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 doesn't happen frequently enough for me to confuse you with, confuse you with it right now. Just keep in mind these two, and I think that'll be sufficient. If you want to know about it, go ahead and watch the video, but I really don't think it's necessary right now. Okay. What are case endings? So we've we've talked about nouns, we've talked about some verbs, we've talked about the genitive. Now we're talking about basically prepositions. So in English, going back to our English prepositions, Jimmy goes to the store. Um, to is the preposition. Susan walks into the house. Into is the preposition. Frank runs from the football field. From is the preposition. Notice we put them before these phrases or these words, right? So this is a prepositional phrase because it's a phrase that's or that's uh, preceded by a preposition. In Sumerian, it's very similar, except they put the preposition after the noun. They just sort of attach it to the noun. So Sumerian prepositions are represented by case endings that are attached to the nouns or the noun phrases. So A2 means house, ta means from. So if you see A2 ta, from the house. Notice the swoop, ready? There's the swoop. So when I when you guys translate, I want you to go because that's the swoop. Is that a swoop sound? Eh, I'm making it a swoop sound. Da means with, right? So lutu da with the man. Lutu means man. Did I say that already? I can't remember. Anyway. Shethri means to or toward. Eden means the step, like the Garden of Eden. Hmm. Anyway, Eden means like the step or the, uh, it's like a fertile, yeah, the fertile step. S-T-E-P-P-E, -E, step. Um, or the, the plane or something. Uh, anyway, so to or toward the step. There you go, toward the Eden. Ra means two or four, this is the dative. Well, Luga means king, so Ra, two, whoosh, the king. Four, whoosh, the king. I really think the shh is helping. It's helping me anyway. So that's how these case endings work. So let's talk about the case endings in a little more detail. Yeah, like a, like a plateau, that's exactly right. It's like, um, we could talk about this more, uh, but it's it's like this sort of fertile land outside of the city where there are animals and um, that sort of thing. So, um, and things grow and it's very fertile, and but it's also like outside the city, right? It's the, yeah, but you're right. It's like the fertile plains outside of the city. Okay. It, it's very, it comes up a lot in the uh, literary text. It co comes up in the laments. It's sort of where you leave the city to go. And um, yeah, when the god leaves the city, he goes out into the Eden. He goes out into the steppe if he's leaving the city to, uh, like to go away in anger or something. Anyway. Okay. So let's talk about that ergative marker. The ergative marker is a really fancy way of saying the the letter e that they put after they attach to a noun that is the subject of a transitive verb okay sumerian doesn't mark the subject of an intransitive verb excuse me so if it says jimmy goes out you won't have an e attached to jimmy because that's going out is an intransitive verb right? There's no object. Jimmy's not doing anything to an object. 
However, it, they will put an E to mark, they'll put an E on the subject of a transitive verb, and they call that the agent, the agent of the sentence. Agent is just a fancy way of saying the subject of a transitive verb. So, in other words, in Sumerian, they would write Jimmy, E, hits the ball. And all that E is doing is saying, hey, everybody, this is the subject of a transitive verb. And a transitive verb, remember, is one that requires an object. Jimmy is doing something to the object. And so they mark him with an E. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. After a vowel, the E may or may not appear. I know, I'm really sorry. Siberians sometimes put stuff in there, sometimes it doesn't, you know, it's a little confusing. Um, but really, if they don't put it in there, it probably means that you don't need it to understand the sentence. I promise once we start translating, um, and if you've been following along in the exercises, there are exercises in every one of these uh, video lessons, you've seen what I'm talking about. It's it's sort of self, it can be self-explanatory. Like, oh yeah, I don't really need the E uh, to mark the subject because it makes sense in the sentence without it. There can also be something cool called vowel harmony. And what that means is if there's a vowel around, like in the vicinity of the E, it can, what they call color it, change it to a different vowel sound. So. The U in Lugal can change Lugal to uh, Lugal A to Lugal U, Lugal U3. So this U3 is just E or the, the, the A, Lugal A. I, I know that's confusing, sorry. When we say that the, the, the vowel, I mean the uh, vowel, yeah, the vowel E, the letter E, I pronounce it as A, Lugal A. Uh, no, I'm not sure what's the convention that we use in uh, Sumerology. I apologize profusely. Um, okay. Uh, so Lugal U3 would just be Lugal A, just with vowel harmony. The, the, this, the E is being colored by this U and turning it to U3. The same thing here, Ama A, because of these A's, these A vowels, this can turn into Ama A. So there you go. The rest of the case endings. We've seen some of these already. Let's just go through them kind of quickly. The dative case, two or four, the dative preposition, um, is ra. So, I built the house for Jimmy would be, I built the Jimmy, uh, sorry, I built the Jimmy. I built the house, Jimmy, ra, for whoosh, Jimmy. I built the house for whoosh, Jimmy. After a vowel, it can appear as ear or air. So, in other words, if uh, ani means his and lugal means king, his king, if they wanted to say for his king, they would put ra after it. However, sometimes, because there's a vowel here, instead of writing ra, they write ear. So, and that's just for ease of pronunciation. So, Lugalani ear would probably be pronounced Lugalnir. Oh, sorry, Lugalanir. That's probably how they would pronounce it. So, it'll, it'll appear as ear, or um, if it's after an E, air. Again, don't worry about memorizing that. Just be aware of it. Is the assumption that the vocal or speech order match the written? Yes, um, uh, we have, uh, and actually part of my dissertation was working with phonetically written texts, um, syllabically, phonetically written texts. So um, we know how, to some degree, we know how they were pronounced and these were read out loud, um, the ones that I worked with. So uh, ostensibly read out loud, so yeah. Um, So, um, I just had somebody, uh, 
write something on the other on the other uh, Megan if you're listening to this somebody just um ugh, YouTubed, I don't know YouTube messaged us uh they commented on the other video that that uh that went um that went bad and he it, it doesn't look like they know we're running this stream right now so if you wouldn't mind shooting a message to them anyway okay it's Mark Hunt anyway all right so sorry everybody sometimes i wish i had a cropping mechanism here um so and i'm sorry there's another a another ah sound uh, another a vowel that can be the locative it means in or into so if we wanted to say in sumerian jimmy walks into the house we would say jimmy walks the house ah so jimmy walks into the house that's the locative <laughs> every time i see this i go oh man something else that's confusing believe me it gets it, it's easier than it seems okay there's something called the locative terminative the lock term we call it and it means to or near to or like up against something and that's a, another E vowel, so A. A very common use of the lock term is to mark, go with me on this, the second object of a compound verb. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Well, let me just see if I can explain it. We saw this verb a little bit earlier. Gu3 means voice. Detu means to pour out. And to pour out the voice means to speak or to say. So, um, compound verbs are made up of a verbal part, a verbal constituent, they say, but a, a verbal part and a noun part or a nominal part, right? So a verb and a noun. Um, so that means that this verb is essentially, this is the object of this verb. Does that make sense? It's pouring out the voice, just like Jimmy hit the ball. So poured out the voice. But because these two things go together as a as a verb, like a single verb to say, well, to say what or to speak to what, right? If you're going to speak to something, how do they mark that thing they're speaking to, which in this sentence is the house, oddly enough. How do they mark that? Well, they mark it with an E, this locative term, this lock term. I know that's a little confusing. Uh, when it comes up again, we'll talk about it again. Um, I, I promise it's easier than what it seems. So that king or its king spoke, poured out the voice to the house, spoke to the house. It's marking that. That's why they call it a second object or fancy term, an oblique object. Um, they mark that with an E. Does that make sense? So, so shu T means to receive, but shu is the object of T. So, but it, but but that's just the first object. You have to receive something. So, if shu T means to receive, how do you mark the thing that you're receiving? Well, you mark it with an E, a locative terminative. All right. If you even a little bit understand that, you're doing really well. So, its king spoke to the house. Sheth three, now they're gonna get easier. Sheth three is the terminative, they call it, to or towards. So if you wanna say eh, toward the house, you say a to Sheth three. The ablative, the fancy word to say from, is ta, so away from. So a to ta would be from the house or away from the house. The fancy word for with is the committative. Um, so with is da. So Lugal Da is with the Lugal, with the king. Gin 7 is um, called the equative. It's the word like or as. So um, um, Lugal Gin 7 would be like a king or as a king. Oh, I'm sorry, Zanos. He says, my head is at the hurt level. Uh, yes, I suspect 
you will have to listen to a couple of times. By the way, just so that everybody that that's watching is clear, this is the combination of four different lessons, right? This is four months <laughs> worth of worth of videos. This is designed. It was initially designed to be a review, right? It's a, it assumed that people had taken four months and gone through these four videos, done all the exercises, um, done all the uh, memorized all the vocabulary. It assumes all those things. So the fact that if you guys are hanging with this at all, you're doing an amazing job. Um, and uh, uh, Ikea, so you're exactly right. Uh, you're exactly right. Um, you're going to have to write this out repeatedly. There's there's no question. That's how these languages work. Any language is, is kind of like that. Um, but again, don't just watch this video or uh, this. Um, <laughs> when do we get to the Anunnaki? Yes. Uh, Good question. Um, yeah. Uh, hopefully, I, I, I may um, have found somebody that wants to come on from the um, the Lord Rael uh, congregation and do an interview on the Non Sequitur Show. Sounds like a really nice guy. He's a Marine. Um, anyway, I don't know why I'm talking about it, but they believe in the Anunnaki. So um, that'd be kind of cool. Anyway. We're almost done, promise. Um, let's talk about one more, uh, one more form that can go on the end of a noun or a noun phrase, and that's called the copula or the linking verb. So, like to be, right, or is. And it's there. There are two different forms. If you want to say he uh, or she is. You say am three. So Lugal am three, he is the king or he is king. Oh, and there it is. Um, I preempted myself, I guess. He is the king. However, or in addition, there is me'en. So you notice this am me probably a correlation there, but me'en means both I am and you are. So this is the third person, they say, and this these are the, this is the first and second person, copula. So if you see uh, shulgi, for example, shulgi all the time in shulgi A, the, the hymn shulgi A, we read a little bit of it last night. He goes, um, the great dragon, the warrior who defeats all the people in the path, the most handsome guy, met N, I am. So that's uh, that's how that works. So Lugal met N, I am, or depending on the context, you are the king. So there you go. Okay, this is the beginning of lesson four and it's very short. Uh, I do a quick review of the verbal chain here. So you don't have to memorize these terms. This first part of the verbal chain, I, I just want you to understand, you've seen a bunch of verbal chains, but I want you to understand the basic makeup of it. We're gonna talk about these individual parts as we go through different lessons. This thing is called a modal prefix. It sets the, the mode uh, of the verb. So this is called a cohortative. There's also like a negation, no or not. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. But that's what this is. This is called a modal prefix. This bad boy is called a conjugation prefix. Every verb is going to have one. There's mu, there's I3, there's ba, there's uh, B2. Anyway. Then the one that we're going to talk about today is called the case element. This is basically the case one of the case endings that we just saw but they just stick it in the middle of the verbal form so that you know to go looking for that case i'll explain that in a minute so there's a there can be a case element in the middle then you've got this what we call the pronominal suffix all that means is it tells you um, who the subject of the verb is b marks an inanimate third person subject Please don't worry about that just yet. But that's all this is. And then here is called your verbal base. 
Nyar means to set or to place. Um, all right, Kurt. Hey, thanks for coming in, man. I appreciate it. Um, I know we'll be seeing more of you, so uh, have a good night, boss. Thanks for coming in. All right. Um, right. So Nyar is the verbal base, and uh, there are other things that can go on the end here, but don't worry about that just yet. But that's basically the verb, the basics of the verbal chain. Again, we'll talk about these things in more detail later. Today, we're going to focus on the case element. So what are case elements? What are these infixes, we call them? Well, they are elements that are in the verbal chain that refer the reader to case endings on nouns in the sentence. Basically, they are little markers that say, hey, um, well, let me just show you. Na is the marker of a dative, a third person dative, right? So it's basically the counterpart to ra, two or four. So if you see mu, na, do 11, mu we know is a conjugation prefix, na, you should say, I wonder if there's a dative, a third person dative somewhere in the in the sentence and so you go looking for it and boom there it is that's all these things do is they tell you hey go looking for that dative in the sentence somewhere it's a sort of a cross-referencing thing so here this would mean um he spoke to him to whom to the king he spoke to, to the king. And you can get them with uh, all these different case elements. So on the dative, on the noun, the, the dative on the noun is ra. The infix forms for the dative are as follows. Ma, ra, na. Okay. There's There are others. We don't have to worry too terribly much about them. These are the three important ones. If you see ma on the front of a verbal chain, that's to me. If you see ra in the middle of the sentence, like we did in that example, that means to you. And if you see na, it means to him or to her. May would mean be to us. We don't know what the second common plural is. Uh, nay means to them. But these are the three um, mostly infixed forms. Ma goes on the very front. Um, but anyway, we don't know. That's special. We don't have to worry too much about that. Basically, the one you need to know about right now is na. That's right. S Sumerian spoke like Yoda. We're 900 years old. You each look as good as you or not. <laughs> it's the only one I know. Sorry. YouTube, please don't take this down because I said something that Yoda said. I said it really badly, so maybe they won't care. All right, how does the committative look? How does um, the uh, the with, da means with, how does that look in a sentence? Well, it looks just like da, right? So da goes right in the middle of the verbal chain. So here it is, da. Um, so you might ask the question, uh, well, on the dative, uh, thanks. <laughs> Great, Yoda. I appreciate that. It's very generous of you. Um, so on the dative, ma means to me, ra means to you, second person. Uh, na means to him or to her. How do they do that with the committative? How do they do that with the word with? So like I'm standing with you or i'm standing uh with him how do they do that well they put these um either vowels or consonants before the da so um thank you zados there uh disney's coming after me um if i wanted to say with him i would put an n before the the da so mu conjugation prefix Un, this is representing that N, da, with 
him. If this were mu e da, it would be with you, second common singular. If it were mu ub da, that would be with it. This is an inanimate singular, and so on. Okay. So again, you don't have to commit that to memory, just sort of be aware of it. Let it wash over you, as my professor used to say. The ablative, hooray, the ablative infix is ta, just like the um, just like the uh, case ending, because ta means from. And the, term, the terminative, if you remember the terminative, to or toward, um, that is she three. Well, in the verbal chain, instead of she three, they just write she, but it looks so close, doesn't it? So, now the locative is different. The locative, if you remember, is you put a, an a vowel, on the end. In the verbal chain, you put ni instead. So, uh, I wanted to show an example of this one. A2, a, a is the locative. A2 means house. Ding ear, n key, right? So ding ear means um, God or goddess. So if it's superscripted like this, if it comes before a proper noun, that probably means that this is a God and we know who this guy is, n key. So A2, a, in the house or into the house, n key, mu, conjugation prefix, ni, this is the locative infix, and it should tell you, hey, go looking for a locative, and there it is. That's all it's telling you, go looking for a locative. So, mu, ni, locative, ku, for. Ku, for means to enter. So, what this would mean is, enki, the subject, it's not marked with an e, so it tells you it's, uh, which makes sense, because this is not a, a transitive verb. Enki entered into into the house enki went into the house what did i translate that as ah i didn't but that's what it means um little side note because of vowel harmony it could be written this knee could be written un so if you see an n there you have to ask yourself is that a locative knee but that's just a you don't have to bother yourself with that too terribly much right now Finally, and this is the last slide before the summary, there are there's a rank of these verbal elements, and we saw it a little bit in the first slide, and you do not have to commit this to memory at all. If you have, um, if you've watched any of, my, any of my videos, you know that I reference um, uh, Mary Louise Thompson's grammar, as she, this, I got this from her book, and um, uh, if you get, Thompson's grammar, you can, it's it's not a it's not an introductory grammar, but it's the best we've got. It's uh, very thorough. But anyway, this chart shows up. So the modal prefix is gonna come first in the verbal chain, then the conjugation prefix. You have to think of these as slots, basically. There's a modal prefix slot. There might not be a modal prefix, but if it is there, it's gonna go in the first slot. The conjugation prefix, it's always gonna be there. It'll go in the second slot, dative, It'll go in the third slot. The terminative, the ablative, and the committative, they can all go in this slot. The locative will come after that, and then the verbal base will come. This is just to let you know that there is an order. Please don't try to memorize that. Um, yeah, now I tell you not to memorize it, sorry. Um, that's how good Trevor is. He just, just picks it up just like that. Um, but they do have an order that they can go in, and if you want, you can just refer back to this if you're... It comes up later when you have um, things in the verbal chain and you're not sure, is that a dative, is that a terminative, or whatever. Is that a... more? It would be more like, is that a dative or is that a locative, because they both are represented with N. Well, you can think about sometimes where it's placed in the verbal chain, and that'll help you identify it. Anyway, it's just a... Make you aware of it. Okay, guys, we have covered a ton. And I'm really proud of all of you for sticking with it. Um, so we've talked about nouns. We've talked about adjectives, verbs in the verbal chain. Uh, then we talked about the genitive construction. And then finally, prepositions. 
and as they show up as case endings or as they show up as infixes. So that is the review. For those of you that have watched all the videos, this should be a nice refreshing thing. Um, for those of you that haven't watched them, that's totally fine. Hopefully this sort of gets the ball rolling. Then when you go back and you watch the videos, you'll be like, oh, I remember he talked about that. That makes sense. Any questions that you have, please feel free to email me. You're gonna see in the um, in the exercises, uh, sorry, in the, the individual videos that there are exercises. As a matter of fact, I should mention this, um, I don't think Megan has published it yet, but we're working on, she, 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 she is working on, I don't wanna take any credit for that because I haven't done anything with it, but she's working on our website and I think it's just about ready. Megan, do you wanna comment on that at all? Um, I think she wants to do, there are these cool pictures that we wanna put up for the front and I think we're going to do those next weekend, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, we're just about to make that that uh, that website go live, or whatever you do with it, publish it uh, on the. Yep, nearly there. Just need to finish off some presentation stuff. Yep. So um, you will find out. Uh, or sorry, I will tell you. <laughs> you won't find out. I'm telling you now. I really need to take my medicine. Um, what was I telling you? Oh, uh, yes, the grammar videos, the the learn to read Sumerian videos. Megan has put all of them up on the website. Uh, on the yeah, on the website that she's going to publish next weekend, I think. Um, yes, thank you, sweetheart. Slides um, along with the PDF or the. Is it a, the PDFs did you put up um, or um, uh, the PDFs or the uh, PowerPoints? I can't remember, but I, in either in either case, they're up on the slot uh, up on the um, up on the website as well. So you can just download those. And uh, but they have exercises, they have vocabulary lists, they have um, sign lists of so vocabulary. Uh, sorry, cuneiform. Okay, she's saying she put the PDFs up. Awesome. Um, so, oops. Um, so, right, you can, uh, you can, there's, it's just like an introductory grammar. So I've got cuneiform signs that I want you to learn. Um, and you, you learn them because, um, you learn them in that order because, uh, um, and, and anyway. Sorry, I feel like I'm losing my train of thought here and I should probably just end this. Um, right, okay, I, I, so, sorry. There's vocabulary with each lesson. There are cuneiform signs, actual signs to learn with each lesson. And as you learn them, um, you know, you put them on flashcards to memorize them, that sort of thing. Okay, we have gone now for uh, about an hour and a half. So thank you all so much uh, for watching and I hope this has been helpful and I'm gonna go ahead and, cause I don't know how to, um, I don't know how to, I gotta, yeah, okay, oops. I'm gonna stop sharing, which hopefully will, good, brought me back. All right, so guys, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I think we had an average of like, 12 or 13 of you guys watching. So um, I think we're up to 20 at one point, Some, something maybe, I don't know. But that's pretty incredible. I mean, that's like twice the number of people that would be in a regular graduate Sumerian class. So I'm proud of all of you. I think this is fantastic. So email me any of your questions. Um, please, if you haven't liked uh, and subscribed, please do so. It really helps us, I think. Um, and um yeah if you if you uh yes right don't forget about skylar tonight he's on at 9 30 thank you so much Santos. um he is doing the uh, demonologist which i really think sounds like a mixologist that mixes for demons that's what i think or maybe a, a demon that does um a demon that does um mixing of drinks for people i don't i don't know anyway it's gonna be really cool and uh, I hope I stay. I can stay awake long enough to do it. I gotta get up and work tomorrow. But um, 
Okay, I'm rambling. So thank you all very much. This has been great. And I will see you again soon. Until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask. <laughs>